Okay, so in this chapter, we're going to discuss calculating g-forces. So there's been a lot of kind of controversy and misconceptions in the field. I wanted to break this down into a very simple form. That way there clinicians from around the world could just basically understand what's going on with g-forces, how we actually calculate g-forces, and kind of some of the issues that have occurred over the years with respect to um, calculating g-forces in platelet-rich fibrin. So we're gonna hop right in and we're gonna go to just the basic understanding of g-force. So of course, as we have an object that's spinning around um, in, a, in a central rotation, so just spinning around in a circle here, of course it's generating uh, centrifugal force, okay? And that's the calculation of RCF here. It's actually a very small, uh, very simple formula and it's dependent on the radius um, primarily. Okay, so the further away we go from the radius, the larger the g-force. So when we actually look at centrifuges, and when we look right here, we have different uh, devices. So we have the interlock, we have the APRF, and we have the salvin. It's very simple to actually calculate the g-forces once you actually have these values. And I'm gonna go ahead and do an example, that way there people can see. The main thing that you need to know, and we'll compare, for example, the interlock versus the APRF system. The interlock is a smaller device, so the maximum radius is 85, okay? The APRF is a larger device, the max radius is 109 here, 109.8. And the salvin system in the study was 103.5, and then they have different angulations. When you typically calculate g-forces, it's typically done at the RCF max. Now, everybody knows that the LPRF protocol is 2700 RPM, and that's for um, 12 minutes. And this one here, the APRF is 1300 for eight minutes. Uh, and some people will use the 14 minute protocol. How do we calculate G-forces? So we're gonna go ahead and do an example. Remember, like I said, the RCF max here is 85, or the R max is 85, and the R max here is 109. So if we look here, this is essentially online. You can go ahead and just do a calculation here. And it's very straightforward. Okay, online you can actually get the calculations that will be produced for you automatically. So in this case here, you can literally enter revolutions per minute here. So let's say for example, we wanna calculate the g-force of the APRF. We know that we're spinning at 1300 RPM, and we know that the radius, as we've seen, is 109. And so when we produce this, it'll give us a g-force. It's actually just that simple. So the g-force for APRF, for example, is uh, 206 G. Okay, that's how that's done. Now, if you want to produce the G-force on another system, let's say, for example, I wanted to make this G-force, which more optimally uh, produces an even distribution of cells on another device. Now, for example, if I had uh, 206 G is what I'd like to produce. If, for example, I have a different radius, Okay, so example, if I use, again, the 109, and I just push enter here, it's gonna basically give me my 1300 RPM, right? That's for the APRF device, the dual quattro. What if I use an intraspin machine? If I use an intraspin machine, it was 85 millimeters, as we've seen in the previous study. Because it's a smaller radius, now we would have to spin at 1470 RPM. Okay, so it's literally just that simple. If I had a bigger, Centrifugation device, let's say I had one that was 150 millimeters, okay? Now I have to spin at 1107 uh, RPM, okay? It's literally that simple, not very complicated, and this is just a little tool um, to evaluate G-forces. So I highly recommend that people that have different machines or wanna just basically understand G-forces better, go to one of these tables, play around with it for you know, uh, five, 10 minutes, you'll very quickly understand how G-force is calculated. And it'll also let you know how the actual effect of the radius impacts uh, the G-forces here. Okay, so one of the things with G-forces that we found with platelet-rich fibrin is that there's been a lot of controversy in the field. And um, essentially, there's been a lot of errors, in fact, that were produced in the literature by many, many different research groups. And of course, uh, we've also made some mistakes in, even in our publication. So I wanna be very transparent about this because it led us to uh, develop a consensus report between four colleagues, which I'll share with everybody uh, in a couple slides. 
This was an article that was written a few years ago between myself, uh, Dr. Shakrun, and Dr. Ganatsi. It was titled Controversies Related to Scientific Report Describing G-Forces from Studies on Platelet-Rich Fibrin, Necessity for Standardization of RCF Values. Okay, so of course, the main message here is, as highlighted in yellow, over the years, numerous reports have failed to accurately report G-force values, which have caused considerable confusion in the field. These values have since been retranscribed incorrectly in many studies moving forward, and this article aims to address this topic to avoid further confusion in the field. Okay? We further highlight how RCF clot is not only a deviation from the standard international method used to report G-force values, but one subject to significant error or owing to centrifugation time, patient hematocrit levels, initial volume of blood collected, and other factors. Okay, so this is something that as we were doing more and more research, we realized that there was actually some errors in the field and probably there was a better way to address this. So let's talk about kind of what was observed in this study, and then from there we can actually make uh, more optimized uh, use of platelet-rich fibrin. Now there's been different ways to report G-forces. You can report G-force at the RCF min, which is at the top portion of the tube, the RCF clot, which is at the clot, or at the RCF max, which is at the bottom of the tube, okay? Internationally, people typically report G-forces at the RCF max, so that's kind of the international standard, and most papers will report it here, but many people have been reporting at the RCF clot, and I want to kind of talk about the literature from back in 2001, 2006, onwards to where we are today, and just discuss kind of the issues that have been created in the field, um, and then more importantly, discuss kind of what we need to do as a community, a dental community, to try and advance this field. So when we look at the literature, um, there were some reports, like I said, uh, by different groups that looked at the RCF that were produced and they compared them to the initial studies and we'll go through them. Originally, uh, some of the work that was done by Shakrun and some of his colleagues were reporting RCF values and it was actually reported at the RCF min. So we'll go through some of those calculations uh, as well as Dohan calculating at the RCF min. Later on, people started using RCF clot as well as RCF max. And so this, by using different G-forces produced at different areas, it really caused a lot of confusion in the field. And the chapter itself, like I said, read through it carefully, because for those that are working in the field as scientists specifically, it's very, very important not to continue to report uh, incorrectly the RCF values in future studies. So when we look at the original studies, and of course, um, Joseph Shakrun was a co-author on these studies, and he's one of the first to kind of look back and say, you know what, there were some errors that were made in some of these original studies. Originally, they were spinning at 2,500 RPM for 12 minutes, or for 10 minutes, sorry, and the reported G-force in the studies was 208 G. Today, it's well known that the G-force reported in this study was actually calculated at the RCF min, okay? And this is based on the fact that the current rotor size was 80 millimeters, Okay, this would have produced 559 G if this was calculated at the RCF max, which is kind of the international standard. Uh, had they used the RCF clot, this would have been 349 G. So again, you can look back to these old studies in 2006. This is a report of G-force at the RCF min. And the big problem is, is that in the studies, colleagues were not reporting where they were taking their G-forces from. So they were just saying, in this study, we produced something and it was 280 G. And another one, they would say 400 G and another one, 350 G. But unless the G-force is always calculated at the exact same area on the tube, of course, that will cause a lot of confusion because even if I have the exact same machine, okay, with the same angulation, and I spin at, let's say, exactly 2,700 RPM for 12 minutes every single time, the G-force that's produced here will be different than the G-force produced at the clot will be different than the G-force produced at the end of the tube, the RCF max. And unless you let the reader know where you calculated that G-force, there's going to be issues there. Okay, and that's what we're kind of reviewing here. So again, later on, uh, David Dohan did another study, 2006, and this was part of uh, the group with Shakrun Dohan, etc. They actually found that, again, 4, 400 G-force, 3,000 RPM for 10 minutes. Um, and this is based on what they were doing here. And again, this was calculated at the RCF min. Okay, so this right here is another representation of, 
you know, differences between the original LPRF protocol. So this is in the same series of the five publications from 2006. Um, and then in 2009, like I said, sometimes they don't even report the RPM. They just say, we made this clot at 400 G. And you don't know if this RPM now is calculated 2700 RPM, which this 400 G is calculated at the clot. You don't know if this was at the RCF min as it was in this study here um, and why there's differences between the two. Um, so again, in the literature initially, there's a lot of variability that were occurring. And of course that confused a lot of people. Um, this one here was one of the first studies where they actually use the 2700 RPM protocol for 12 minutes. That's the current interest spin. And they reported it as 700 G and that's actually more correct. So these are one of the first studies that were conducted in the field where they actually calculated the G-force at the bottom of the tube. Even to this day, you see a lot of people, they're calculating the 2700 12-minute protocol on the intro lock and they report it as 400 G. But in fact, that 400 G is actually reported at the RCF clot and not at the RCF max. Okay, again, more studies here, RPM not reported, uh, other studies here. So a lot of variability that's found in the literature. Again, when you report 1000 G, you don't know if, where this is calculated at because they're not reporting the RPMs uh, using these different devices. Okay, around the year 2017, this is where it became kind of uh, a little bit of an issue because between different groups, like I said, some groups were reporting, uh, for example here, reporting 2700 RPM for 12 minutes, and this is approximately 400 G, and our group is reporting 2700 RPM for 12 minutes, and this is 708 G. And this was calculated at the RCF clot, this is calculated at the RCF max, but neither one of these teams is actually reporting where they're calculating their G-force. So of course, for the average person reading these groups, they're looking at some of these studies and they're kind of scratching their head and they're saying, well, why is there such a big variability? And the reason is because the G-force is calculated in different areas. Um, and to make matters worse, like I said, some studies actually report, you know, spinning at 28,000 RPM on the intralock machine and that's not even possible, it doesn't go that high. Um, and again, other authors now are reporting the same 400 G that they used on the same machine where they reported uh, 3000 RPM. Now they're saying 2700 RPM is now 400 G's as well. So all this to show, like I said, there's been a lot of confusion in the field. And one of the things that was written in this article, uh, first of all, the original G forces for the LPRF were not reported correctly, neither at the RCF clot or the RCF max, and there was much variation in the protocols that were utilized originally. Um, both some of these authors were changing the protocols, okay, so there was a lot of variability in the literature between 2500 and 3000 G, and again, the articles that were cited by some of our colleagues, Dr. Pinto and Dr. Kurunen, were describing the initial G forces as 400 G calculated at the RCF max, where, or clot, sorry, where they're actually reported at the RCF min. Um, so long story short, like I said, there's been a lot of variability in the field. One of the things that was needed at the time was basically a consensus report. And I'm very, very happy uh, that this came out. So it was published in the journal of Perio between four colleagues and probably four of the people doing most of the research in platelet-rich fibrin, between myself, Dr. Nelson Pinto, Mark Kroon, and, and Shaham Ganazzi. And one of the things and the reason for this article was to say, look, Moving forward, everybody should ideally be reporting G-forces um, in the same way so that people can utilize the papers and actually advance the field. And so there was a series of various things that were written, and I'm going to go through them. This is a standardization of relative uh, centrifugal forces in studies related to platelet-rich fibrin. And again, it was written by the four colleagues here. It was published in 2019 in the journal of Perio. In the article, there was the following six things that was needed and necessary to report in every single article on platelet-rich fibrin. Number one, the dimensions of the rotor, okay, the radius needed to be reported either at the clot or at the end of the tube. The angulation, if you're going to use a fixed angle centrifuge, should be reported. The rotations per minute, so the RPM and the amount of time. The RCF value calculated either the RCF min, clot, or the RCF max. And the reason why is because people were not reporting where, where they were taking the RCF values from. That causes a lot of confusion. Um, and then the composition and size of the tubes that are used to produce PRF and the centrifugation model. As long as you use these six different, as long as you reported these six 
parameters, then colleagues could read the studies and know exactly what was done. And from there, the field could then be advanced. So if you're a researcher in the field, like I said, and you're gonna write publications in the future on platelet-rich fibrin, this right here are the six uh, key steps and parameters that are necessary for future studies. Okay, and again, when it comes to calculating G-forces, one of the points that was made by our team, it depends if you take it from the R-min, the R-clot, or the R-max. So in these cases here, I wanna just discuss one of the limitations and one of the reasons why when calculating the R-clot, it's a little bit, you know, um, there's a little bit of variability there, and we'll discuss that. And the reason why people use the RCF max uh, is for obvious reason is that this never varies. So long story short, when you produce pure F, as we've reviewed previously, sometimes the clots can be bigger, they can be smaller, um, and that's simply as a result of being male, female, and it depends if you spin for three minutes, five minutes, eight minutes. So one of the things that we found is that if you report uh, the RCF values at the clot, you may run into some issues, okay? And if we're gonna discuss this here, and we wrote this in one of our articles, there was a really nice study that was done by Cordellini and the group uh, down in Leuven in Belgium. But one of the problems is, is they took the RCF clot value, and the problem is, is that if you spin at 2700 RPM for three minutes or 12 minutes, that clot is gonna be located at a different area. And if you look at the RCF value at the clot here, the radius is very different than it is down here. Whereas had they reported at the RCF max, it would have been identical here, okay? Because over time, like I said, whether you spin for three minutes, six minutes, nine minutes, 12 minutes, you're constantly going to be producing a bigger and bigger clot over time. And for that reason, the RCF value produced at the clot here is different here, even though the RPM is exactly the same. If you would have just taken the RCF max, then it remains the same throughout. So again, that's something that's explained throughout the chapter. I highly recommend people read it. And it's just to basically understand a little bit better, you know, what's going on uh, with G-forces. So here's just a little cartoon diagram. If you have the exact same RPM, 1300 for three minutes, six minutes, nine minutes, and 12 minutes, if you calculate this at the RCF max, it's always exactly the same as you see here. If you calculate it at the clot, because the clot is getting bigger and bigger from three minutes, six minutes, nine minutes, 12 minutes, the clot is getting bigger. And as a result, the RCF value at the clot is changing. And that's quite confusing, okay? You're better off doing it at the max where it's always gonna be the same versus at the clot where it's gonna change depending on how much time you're gonna use. And it's one of the reasons why our group, you know, probably said, you know, it's probably a better idea to simply report uh, all the RCF values at the max as what's done internationally.